All right, Matthew chapter number 14, if you'd like to turn there. In thinking about or looking at this particular passage, I find a a perplexity or a quandary of what a lot of people think that the Christian life is supposed to be about or like, that once they get saved, that their troubles or their problems are over. Now, you're Bible believers, and most of you know better than that, but it doesn't hurt to be reminded sometimes especially in the day and time in which we live, where we get this concept or idea that even because of the country that we live in, that we should get some kind of special favor because somewhere along the line, a deist or uh, some of the druids or whatever put in a thing in God we trust and we assume that that means that we're under some sort of protective umbrella and that that means that we're going to get a break. Well, I hate to tell you this, that we don't get a break because we're under the protective umbrella of the 13 stripes. We don't get a break because of a constitution. We get the privilege of going through things that we don't understand, knowing that we know somebody that does understand, and that will never leave us and never forsake us, and he'll help us get through it. He doesn't say that you'll be delivered always from it. But sometimes it helps to understand, to get a a better concept of the Christian life. Look, I'm not telling you uh, to be prepared, stand by for heavy rolls because everybody's going to get it. But in life, all of us have trouble. Lost people have trouble. The difference in us and lost people is, is that when we have trouble, we have Jesus to help us with the trouble, to comfort us when they don't get the comfort. But ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this to you. Just because you're saved does not mean that the bank account's going to be full. As a matter of fact, it's a little bit of a trade-off. If the bank account is full, then our blood pressure's down. But if the bank account's empty, then our blood pressure's up. <laughs> It's, it's a swap off in the Christian life on a regular basis. And oftentimes it is there to test, to try, to prove uh, ourselves and our faith in Jesus Christ. But I think oftentimes it's because there's a misconception. And often that leads because of that expectation to severe disappointment because we think that when trouble has come that God has forgotten us or that God is mad at us or that we're being singled out. None of that is true. God just simply allows when the trouble comes, as he says in the book of Job, man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. But I'm going to try this morning to give you a thought, to give you an idea that when you go through trouble, how to help you to get through trouble. My text is Matthew chapter 14 to start with. Pick it up in verse number 22. This is right after they fed the 5,000 people here and now they're getting ready and the Bible says in 22 and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him to the other side. Could I ask you this question? Are the disciples doing exactly what the Lord told them to do? He picked the boat for them to get in and they got in. He told them to row. And they rode. He said, I'm going up in a mountain to pray. And he leaves them, notice, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray, and the evening was come, and he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, and the wind was contrary. Brother Larry, pray. Ask the Lord to help us, would you please? somewhat of a sound mind to to be able to know your presence and and to recognize who you are in our lives. Thank you for church. Thank you for the word of God. We ask for your help for your preacher this morning, our preacher, as he brings the word of God to us, the message for this hour. Pray, Lord, you'd help us with it. Help our hearts, Lord, to be cleansed and pure as much so as possible this morning, washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus. God, that we might 
be able to take the word in and put it to use in our life, apply it to ourselves. Thank you, Lord, that we're able to stir ourselves up when we're down. But we thank you for the word of God and preaching in church, God, that helps us when we're among believers. Thank you for the brethren. Thank you for this place. Thank you for what you're doing here. For this ministry, we give you great praise. For all that goes on here, we give you praise. With the building and the workers there as well. Lord, for this hour, we need your help. Amen. We've come, Lord, looking for what you're doing for us and going to do for us. So be with us in this hour. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated. I have been around long enough to, to see Christians go through difficult times. And when you learn to love people in the Lord, you hurt when they hurt. And it bothers you when you see them going through it and there's not anything that you can do. I, I don't really know and I don't think I fully comprehend or understand how my mom and dad, that are very dear to me, my dad's gone on to be with the Lord now, but how right after they started serving the Lord and were preaching, or he was pastor of two churches in Alabama and going to school, giving up his career in baseball and so on and so forth, and even in architecture, he had degrees and all that other kind of stuff, and decided to pastor two little, I don't know, nerdy well churches, small at best, but third and fifth Sunday in one, second and fourth, or third, and, I guess first and third, and then second and fourth in the other, and then all of them come together for a sing and, and those kind of things, and then uh, my mom wound up pregnant and then she wind, wound up two days and two nights after the birth of losing the child. And, and to me, that right off the bat, it, it, it's, it's, I don't, that doesn't, I can't really comprehend that. I think about Brother Lentz who comes back from Vietnam and he didn't get saved immediately after Vietnam. It's a miracle he made it back from Vietnam. A lot of his friends did not make it back from Vietnam and he was in the thick of things and it seems that the Lord preserved him and he came back over here and he got his life squared away. He got saved and he went to Bible school and fell off a scaffolding and broke his back and laid up in the hospital but yet he continued to go to school after he got out and he finished school and then he went up to where I just was in Dyersburg and, and got run out of the church there because of a very, very wealthy man that was in that town at the time and he wound up down in, in Valdez that they, him and Cheryl and Travis went through some, some terrible things and then at the young age of 54 years of age he absent from the body and present with the Lord. Not everybody lives the kind of life that the old preacher lived. He was able to go through life relatively unscathed and until the very end when everything began to fall apart. But, you know, by that time, 96 years on earth, that's not a, that's not a bad lick, you know. It's not a bad amount of time to be around. And he got a lot accomplished in his latter years. He really hit his stride in the, in the latter part of that, running prisons with him. You have to remember, he's nearly 70 when, I, when he starts coming over here and we start running prisons. And yet he's gone. You start thinking about people that you know in life and you see them go through the fires of disease and the fires of divorce and, and the fires of difficulty. And not everybody makes it back. I mean, Stephen is having his brain stone out. He's one of the, the, the deacons that is chosen there. And he's up there and he's preaching, men and brethren, and he gives them, he lays down the law and we're thinking about Moses and thinking about Abraham and they're amen in him. And the next thing you know, he's laying down and saying, Lord, lay not the sin of their charge. And just like that, his life is cut short, just like that. And he's serving the Lord. And I get to stringing some things together. I look at Peter. Peter, it looks as it says in, in legend that he is crucified upside down. But he served the Lord. John on the Isle of Patmos was, was tortured and then sent to the Isle of Patmos. Got a great revelation while he was alone and then came back somewhere around 96 AD and, and penned the book of Revelation. Moses, 40 years, uh, then he messed up and then 40 years on the backside of the desert and then 40 years and yet makes a mistake even after all of that and commits a sin and God doesn't let him go in the promised land, his life ends. Right. Yeah. Daniel winds up, as you heard the lady singing about, 
he's loving the Lord and serving the Lord and he's taken into captivity and Daniel winds up in a lion's den. The three Hebrew children wind up in a fiery furnace. I mean, after you look at this stuff for a while, it's almost a little strange. You look at a man named Joseph, probably the greatest type of Christ in the Bible in about 152 or so particulars that you could nail down. And you look at Joseph and he winds up being sold and he goes into the pit and then he goes to Potiphar's house and gets falsely accused. He winds up in prison and some years later he winds up being in the palace but he didn't think he was ever going to the palace and when you read that story you're thinking that's God's servant? God's servant is being treated like that. If you take the time this afternoon, if you would uh, be so kind as to go into 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 and you read about the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Paul is no doubt the Apostle to the Gentiles. And he's been trained at the feet of Gamil. And yet the Apostle Paul says in prisons often and fastings often and hunger and often and naked often, often uh, in perils of turmoil and perils of my own countrymen and, and perils at sea and perils here and perils there and whipping and 40 stripes save one and so on and so forth above five times and winding up in jail. And he finishes pinning his final epistle in a jail cell. And you begin to think to yourself, this doesn't make sense. I got saved to avoid hell. But many people think they're getting saved to avoid physical trouble. And it ain't so. It's not even biblical. Amen. Jesus Christ comes on the scene and He's born. And you hear a little bit about Him. Then you hear nothing after He's two years of age. You don't hear anything until He's 12. And He goes into the temple there at 12 years of age. And He's sitting there talking and... They think so little of it. Mary and Joseph leave Jesus. And then they recognize when they get back home, where's Jesus? And then they come back and Jesus is still sitting there talking to them. And they say, what have you been doing? He said, I've been about my father's business. I've been down here talking to these individuals. And then he disappears off the scene until he's about 30 years of age. And then there he is when he comes walking out across there. John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God, take away the sin of the world and not fit to unlatch the, his shoelaces and that kind of thing and baptize him and out in the wilderness he goes. And he spends three and a half years and he is not greeted kindly. Everywhere he goes, there's some sort of an insurrection. Somebody is trying to cause trouble and with him, carrying with him, being with him, walking with him, talking with him, all the time is Judas a devil. And somebody is constantly trying to undermine the Son of God and what He is trying to accomplish. And then the next thing you know, He has the Lord's Supper there. And they get up from the Lord's Supper. They go out into the Garden of Gethsemane. He prays, not my will, but thine be done. There's the rustle in the bushes. And then here they come to take Him away. Uh, they beat Him to nearly to death. If He could have given His... I mean, He, didn't, he had to give His life up, but they, they tried to kill Him. And they mock Him and they laugh at Him and they scourge Him and they pluck out His beard... And then they hang him naked on the cross. And you're thinking to yourself, somebody just made it, must have made a mess of this. But I think the downfall or the failure has been that we of preachers have been so positive minded that we're afraid to bring up the positivity of our suffering makes sense. But only in light of eternity. And I think that the reason that many Christians are delusioned today is because their concept is, now that I'm saved, God owes me a long life. God owes me a healthy life. God owes me healthy children. God owes me a life without prodigal children or grandchildren. God owes me a good job. God owes me a new car. God owes me a, a, a new house. God owes me new clothing to wear and a promotion. And the mentality becomes almost kind of nauseating because it's so contrary to the Bible because He doesn't promise you any of those things this side of eternity. The only mention of a mansion for you is, is He says in John 14, I'm going to prepare for you a mansion. And if it were not so, I would have told you. 
In my father's house are many mansions, he says. And if we're not so, I would have told you. And if I'm going there to build, and I doubtless will come again and receive you unto myself, and there you will all be also. And Thomas says unto him, uh, so ask him, he said, and, and, and you know the way. And Thomas said, how do we know the way? And the Lord said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But you're not going there to get the mansion. That's just part of what goes with being in Christ. I've looked very little at the news. I have some people that keep me very, very well informed, and it it, it prevents me from having to get bogged down filtering things. But right now, things in the world are not good, even though your bank account might be doing okay right now and the car is full of $3 gasoline, $3 a gallon gasoline. Things are beginning to unravel. Yeah. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that Turmoil is beginning to build. I am not referring to the presidency. I'm talking about worldwide yeah. events. Right. Not just what's happening in Duval County. Right. Quickly becoming about fifth or sixth in the country for murders. Yes. But that's commonplace in all major cities and now rural cities. Because you're getting back to the days of Noah. And in the days of Noah, it's not just the fact that people or individuals are living wild and crazy. People are beginning to take matters into their own hands. And they're eliminating people that don't agree with them. And so then we have a Christian. Love the Lord, got saved, believe the book. I'm faithful to come to church. I'm faithful to read my Bible. I even study a little bit. Might even be in Bible school. I'll give up my Sundays for the Lord. I try to do right. I try to live right. I, I, I try to keep short accounts. When I mess up, I fess up. Little infantile things seem to be very small and very minute, and yet the Lord convicts me, and I don't want to take advantage of that. I mean, I want to take advantage of that. I don't want to disregard it. So I get that thing right, and then I, I get that thing right, and I'm trying to live right, and then trouble comes, and you're turning the barrel. Why am I turning the barrel? Why not? I'm not saying that to be smart. I, I'm, I'm saying we can't say why. Now listen, we know that whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom He receiveth. But let's be honest, ladies and gentlemen. His punishing of His children, at least my experience has been, He's pretty, um, shall we say, gracious. Yeah. He's pretty long-suffering, shall we say? And doesn't he usually use words long before he uses a whip? Yes. And doesn't he kind of let those words sink in a little bit? And sometimes after those words begin to sink in, you begin to think, man, good night. Why didn't I listen? I wish I'd have listened and I wouldn't have banged my head. Right? right? Amen. Now you bang your head and the first thing you think is, I should have listened to what he told me. Yes, sir. But then when he does get your attention, isn't he quick to forgive you and put your feet back on the path and say, let's go? Well, Lord, I messed up and I, I did this and I've been out so long. The Lord's like, okay, you're right. You did all those things, but talking about it ain't changing nothing. Let's go. Yeah. Isn't he good about that? Yes. Yeah. And yet some of us find ourselves just like we do here in this story where the apostles are doing exactly what God says to do. And the wind is contrary. It's one step forward and two steps back. And every time you think you're moving forward, you get knocked back. And every time you're moving forward, you get knocked back. I think my marriage is getting a little bit better. And then bang, bang. And then after a while, it's thinking, man, why even bother to take another step forward? I think everything's getting better. And then all of a sudden, the kid's gone off the rail. Yeah. Failing grades come in from the teachers. And all of a sudden, they're literally checked out or... Worse yet, they've gone and gotten into some kind of trouble and you didn't know anything about it and then all of a sudden you find out about it and you're like, how did that happen? They've been in church. They've been in Brother Sam's class. They've been to youth camp. They've been doing everything they ought to be doing and all of a sudden it's like, where's the 666 in their forehead? They became Damien overnight. That precious child all of a sudden turns into some demon-possessed man of gathering. 
and you're trying to make sense of it, you're doing right. You're training up the child in the way he should go. And I'll be jumped, he's departing from it. And you're trusting in the promises. And the waves are filling up your boat. And the wind is contrary. And you're slapping that water as hard as you can. And your back is full steam ahead. And you've got calluses on your hands. Well, you're pulling against that because the Lord told you to row. And man, are you rowing. And the storm is raging. And the wind is blowing. And you're still going. And you aren't going anywhere. If anything, that wind is beginning to push you back against it. And the temptation is throw the oars in the boat and just let the wind take you wherever it takes you. And the Lord's watching. And now the waves are beginning to fill up the boat. I ask myself this question when I read stories about Harlan Popov, when I read about the, the preacher in the 1600s that was taken out in Massachusetts and they brought him out there and they brought a big old bull of a man out there with him because they told him you can't preach about Jesus Christ and you can't preach about salvation. In those days they had uh, churches on the square there and everybody wanted to could get up and this preacher got up and was preaching about Jesus Christ and him crucified directly contrary to the Roman Catholic Church and that baptism didn't save you. Salvation was by grace alone and so he got convicted by the law people that were there and by the, the Catholic church and they took him out in the public square and they stripped him down from the waist up and they tied him to a whipping post and that big old bull got there and he began to pop that whip back and forth and then he laid that lash across that guy's back and I mean I mean tore his back from one side to the other and that old preacher just hung limp on those chains that were holding him up there he just hung limp nobody speaking up for him nobody saying anything blood dripping dripping down, filling up his pants pockets with blood. And the, the guy comes up to him, it is said in that illustration, and he puts that old foul breath right in his face. And he said, what do you think about that, preacher? And the preacher is said to say, son, it is as if you have whipped me with roses. They dipped the preacher in oil and took him out and impaled him and set him on fire. And it's said that he began to sing hymns during the time. I have a picture in my office of Christians huddled together around where they burned other Christians as the foyer, as the entrance way, uh, as the, the precursor to the main event. And they've released lions and tigers and bears and they're fighting each other to try to get at this group huddled around this burned out individual hanging on the cross there. And it is said that as their bones were snapping and as their necks were snapping and as the animals drew blood and crushed them and killed them and tore them asunder, that even the children and we're singing hymns. I think about that. I wonder about that. I, I think, where does God give them the grace to be able to do that? What is it that keeps that individual going? Look, if you will, with me in Luke chapter number 17. I wonder what it is that moves a woman over in Luke chapter number 7. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says of that woman that she came in there and she was so moved by what Jesus did for her that she bowed down at His feet and began to be moved with such tears of gratitude and joy that she wet His feet to the point they needed to be dried. And she took her hair and used it as a towel to wipe the feet of the greatest preacher that's ever been, Jesus and says, in a sense, I sure am glad you came by my way. But there was a Pharisee there. And the Pharisee said, you know, if he knew what manner of woman it was that was touching him, he wouldn't allow that. But it's interesting that her trouble had brought her to Jesus and he had helped her and in spite of the rude, ignorant, stupid comments of that Pharisee, the law keeper in those days, in spite of those things, she did not allow it to affect her telling Jesus, I sure do appreciate what you did for me. I'm reminded of the story in John chapter number 12. I'll not be too long this morning, but I, I want to try to drive home a point because I'm, I'm trying to come up with a hypothesis. 
I'm trying to come to a conclusion that makes sense. I'm trying to review the evidence of how is it that these people have been through so much trouble, trial, turmoil, difficulties, disease, divorce, death. And yet they're still serving the Lord. I want what they got. I don't want to be one of those fair weather Christians. I don't want to be one of those people that I'm all for Jesus as long as I'm getting what I want to get. I want to be one of those that is faithful to Him no matter what He allows in my life. I want to be one of those that people can look to and say, man... I mean, he got a raw deal, but he stayed faithful to Jesus. Man, he got the wrong end of the stick, but he stayed faithful to Jesus. He had every reason to stop rowing, but he stayed faithful to Jesus. If I was him, I would have quit, but he stayed faithful to Jesus. I want to be that person, but I need help. Because it doesn't make sense. And too often, people come to our churches, or even us as Christians... And they say, if God is so good, why? And then fill in the blank. And I've had it said sort of in a roundabout fashion, although them being very careful, but saying in a sense, if God is so good, what happened to Michael? If God is so good, what happened to your sons and daughters? If God is so good... Why are people still dying? Why are people still getting sick? Why is it that you're saying God is good when you're staring upon a grave site, a marker, a tombstone, and it looks like that garden has been sown with nothing but concrete? Cold, hard marble and cement slabs with slabs sticking up as if they're flowers with no blooms, no blossoms. And they say different things and remind us of those going on. And we go to the cemetery and say, God is good. And they look at the cemetery and say, well, that's a funny kind of good. And we go to the cemetery and we receive comfort, although there's tears. And we do sorrow, but not as those that have no hope. Life can oftentimes be a valley of tears. Can't have a mountain without at least two valleys. And we look at the valleys and realize that's where the richness of the soil is. That's where the minerals and the vitamins and all of the good soil, when the rain comes, it washes off of that mountain peak that might be a cold place, it might be an arid place, it might be a dry place, but when that rain comes, it washes that stuff down there. And the fertile lands of those low spots in our life are where things grow and where the roots run deep and where the water is plenteous. And it's in those valleys that we learn things in the Christian life that other people can cannot learn. Amen. And why? And why? And why? And how? How do they do that? I wonder as Mary came in in John chapter number 12, it's one of the most touching yet significant stories in all the Bible. It is a place where a woman is exalted above men. It is a place where there is a memorial not built to an apostle, not built to a great prophet. It is a place where a simple woman who is not known for anything but sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening when He talks walks in to a men's meeting and takes her retirement. That box of alabaster box with very costly spikenard in it. And she walks in and says, that's the one without whom I would be nothing. That's the one if he hadn't have been by my way, I would have nothing. Not just now, but in the forever. What did she have? Not much. But what she had, he had. 
And he's sitting there. And in she comes. And she's not carrying more food. Or refills of water or tea. She's got a box. Everybody knows that alabaster box contains an ointment inside that is very costly. It is laid up for her so that she doesn't have to worry that if she doesn't become married, she does not have to become dependent on some jack leg to take care of her that could force her to do whatever he wanted her to do because in a sense he would own her. That was laid up for her to protect her about ever being in that situation. And in essence, when she broke that box, she said, I'm not depending on my retirement. I'm not depending on the protection that the little bit of money this can bring. I'm depending on you. I'm counting on you. And if you see fit, I'll be the one that will be taken care of. I'll be the one that will be watched over. I'll be the one that will be protected. I don't need to depend on this. I'm depending on you. It wasn't just for what he had done. It was a testimony of what he could do. And the boy said, Why this waste? And the Lord said, Why are you running that mouth? You know what he says? Shut up. Let her alone. She hath wrought a good work on me. See boys, what y'all don't understand is, is that with one stroke of the pen, with one busted box, with one act of her gratitude on me, she just said, Lord, I'm trusting you. I don't know what the value is going to be of the alabaster box full of ointment. and Whether the markets will rise and fall. But more than that, Lord, I am trusting you to find the right one or to protect me from the wrong one. So what I got that gives me safety and security and protection. What I got that ensures me of not being with the wrong person. I, I don't need it. Oh no, she didn't take the lid off and give him 10%. She gave it all. And the Lord said, that box and that ointment, there's no greater picture of me than what that woman just did. And she busted the box. How was she able to do that? I mean, you talk about faith. Literally, if he's not who he says he is, Man, she is in danger. Because financially, if something happened to Lazarus, who, if you'll remember, had died and then was resurrected, but when he died, she would no longer have a covering. And she's like, I don't need Lazarus. I got Jesus. So Lazarus, you can go on back to bed now. You ever wonder why... Mary and Martha were so upset if Lazarus died. They're not married. The only people that had status in those days were male. I mean, no offense, it's just biblical. Women were worth less than an animal. That's in the Bible. So when the man of the house, in this case their brother passed away, they can't keep it propped up for long. 
That's why that's John 11 and John 12. Mary's like, oh, I don't need Lazarus. I got Jesus. Amen. Yes. I wondered in my mind's eye what it is that keeps individuals under such great strain faithful to the Lord. How does He provide? How does He minister to them in those dark hours? I think I might have found it in Luke chapter 17. Look, if you will, with me. Come all the way to verse 12. You've seen the story before. The Bible says, And he entered a certain village and met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. They lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. He fell down on his face at his feet, down there where Mary spent a lot of time, giving him... Do you see it? Yes. Thanks, and he wasn't even one of the chosen people. He was a Samaritan, an outcast, a misfit. And the Lord's response to that was in verse 17, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God except or save this stranger, this stranger. Other nine knew better. The other nine were Jews. The other nine knew the idea, the thought of gratitude, and the Samaritan would be considered less than a dog, less than just a regular Gentile. They were a half-breed. They were a mix. Heinz 57. I don't know any way to paint it for you except nobody wanted them. Yet... When you get leprosy, you get things in common with people who otherwise wouldn't have anything to do with you. That clean Jew would have nothing to do with a Samaritan, but let that Jew get leprosy and that Samaritan get leprosy. All of a sudden, there's some commonality, and they forget about your generics. They forget about your genetics. They forget about your bloodlines. They forget your, we, what we got in common. I got leprosy. You got leprosy. I got leprosy too. Hey, have you tried eye, bat, and wing of newt? No, but I've tried taking bacon salad, throw it over your shoulder, turn around three times, stand on your head. It seems to slow things down a little bit. Well, I went to see Dr. Bottle Stopper. Well, I did too, and he didn't do me any good. I mean, I don't know what we're going to do. All of a sudden, the division that occurred brought unity in pain and suffering. Yes. Yes. Come on, brother. Amen. There were lepers. Amen. And they've tried everything. I approach the passage a little bit differently as I've gotten older. Because what I was thinking originally was is that the leper is thankful for being cleansed. And that would be a little bit of a shallow interpretation, honestly. Because the leper could have been cleansed and still be a Samaritan, and the leper could have been clean and still been a Samaritan, but it wouldn't have done him any good in eternity because if he hadn't had leprosy, he'd have never met Jesus. And so I think he's thanking him... For the leprosy. Yes. I think he is thanking him for the trouble. Yes. I think he is applying the apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we glory in tribulation yes. and in persecution. And we're happy when we're called to suffer for Christ. The leper comes back and Gets down there on his knees at the feet of Jesus. He doesn't know the proper position. He doesn't know how to approach a priest. He's a Samaritan. He ain't never been to church a day in his life. 
He knows nothing about protocols, about how to approach somebody, but something so moved him over and above that bunch of religious individuals who no doubt are indignant that they got the leprosy because sickness was a sign of sin in those days and they were no doubt indignant thinking, why would you do that to me? I'm not a sinner. They're sinners. I'm not like the publican over there beating your chest with your head bowed and saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I fast twice a week, give over and above the tithe, and I come in here and do this and do that and all that. I mean, I'm a righteous person. The Samaritan would have no way of knowing, but he's so moved that he recognizes something that the Jew never got. He recognizes Man, do you realize that I was an outcast? I've heard it say, go, go, no, go, go not to the lost, go not to the Gentile, nor unto the Samaritans, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. My infirmity put me in a position that he overrode the dispensation to come to me because if it hadn't been for the infirmity, he would have never come to see me. I'd have been an outcast. I'd have been a ne'er-do-well. I would have been done for. But because of my disease, they stuck me in a leper colony with all these stinking Jews that don't like me anyway. But they're dying like I am. The Jew in the passage seems to be indignant like, yeah, I got leprosy. Go pronounce yourself. About time. I didn't deserve the infirmity. I didn't uh, appreciate the infirmity. I shouldn't have ever had it. Now, I could give you a list of names that should have had it. And when he said go show, they're like, yeah, you ain't kidding about time. And the first thing I'm going to do is take an ad in the Chattanooga Free Press and I'm going to say, listen, I had leprosy, but I was misdiagnosed and I have been cleansed and I'm clean. I'm open for business. I don't know who's been putting stuff out on social media about me having leprosy. Go ask the preacher. I'm clean. Always have been. That's probably how they went back. There's no mention of that other nine other than by Jesus saying, where are they at? They're where a lot of us are today. Why do I have leprosy? What are people saying about me? Why am I confined to quarters? Because I got leprosy and I don't deserve leprosy and I shouldn't have leprosy. I mean, I exercise and eat organic. <laughs> leprosy was a filthy disease. It is more common among people with poor hygiene. Can you imagine? What it was like for an Orthodox Jew to be considered dirty. Yeah. The Samaritan's like, yeah. I'm just a dog, man. I'm like the woman at the well, Syrophoenician, man. I mean, you know what I tell you? I'm like the Syrophoenician woman who has a daughter that's possessed the devil. What do you expect? We're just dirty people. Yeah. Wouldn't be uncommon for us to get it. Not making any bones about it. But he comes back. And in this story, buried in the confines of the New Testament in just a few verses and not even in the other Gospels, just written by a doctor, Luke kind of is like, you know what, I've seen that. I've given somebody a prescription, they got better. They never wrote me a letter, never said thank you. All they do is talk about when I misdiagnosed something or that they couldn't get me when they needed me or whatever it might be. And he's kind of like, I'm going to put this story in the Bible to go, hey, Dr. Jesus feels the same way. There you go. And yet we find buried like a diamond 
in the mines of Africa, yet unpolished and undiscovered, we find a cornucopia, a, 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 an opening that begins to glisten as you dig it out and you wash it off and you put a little polish on it and the next thing you know, that thing that looked like just an old piece of coal down there that would be a castaway and, and be good for nothing, all of a sudden with a little bit of cleansing and a little bit of washing and a little bit of cleaning, it begins to take, pick up in all of its little fragments and all of its little facets. They each began of those cracks to reflect the sun in which you're now holding it. And what you're holding before you right now didn't come from an Orthodox Jew. It didn't come from one of the apostles. It came from a leper. A misfit. And I believe, because the Bible says, where are the other nine that return to give glory to God? He didn't say glory to God. Well, how do I give glory to God? He just said, thank you. Doesn't say he said, thank you for the cleansing. It said he just said, thank you. I think he's thanking him for the trouble. For without the trouble, he'd have never met Jesus. The gratitude, I think, in the passage is the very thing that has kept apostles, prophets, preachers, teachers, missionaries, can I just say Christians, was gratitude. He says... In Timothy, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Amen. Give thanks always for all things. Yeah. First Thessalonians 5, giving thanks always. It's all through there. Why? He doesn't say, give glory to God. He says, be thankful Amen. for all things. For all things work together for good to them that love God. And them that are called according to His purpose. Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state that I am in. Yes. Yes. Therewith to be content. Therewith to be thankful. I've learned how to be abased. I've learned how to abound. I've learned how to have and to not have. I've learned how to be naked and hungry. I've learned how to be well, properly clothed and have bread. I've learned to be happy in a jail cell. I've learned to be happy out on the road. I have learned that whatever state I am, God is still good. Amen. Amen. And I'm even thankful for the kids going prodigal. And for the disease and the sickness and the divorce. I'm thankful. You say, why? Because I want to give glory to God. You've heard me, heard me tell this story before. I'll tell it and I'll close, give you some time maybe to think a little bit. The Bible says here that when he left, he said unto him, the Lord speaking to him, Arise, go thy way. He doesn't say thy faith that made thee cleansed. He said, thy faith hath made thee whole. Whatever leprosy took from you, yeah. I gave it back to you. Mm -hmm. Your nose fell off. Mm -hmm. It's back on now. Right. Your ears fell off. They're back on now. Mm -hmm. Your fingers, your toes fell off. They're back on now. You're more than clean. Yeah. Now you're whole. Amen. When you grab that understanding... It's not just a restoration of physical things. It's a spiritual peace of mind. I'm whole. People look at us and go, man, you're blowing my mind. Why? You're under such pressure, under such trouble, under such trials, under such difficulty. How is your able to do that? I'm so glad. Because I get to meet the Lord at 3 o'clock in the morning. Amen. I get to see a side of God a lot of people don't get to see. I become His special child. Amen. Jim and I were over in Romania. One of the many trips we took over there. 
And there are a lot of funny stories to tell about that, but we had been teaching in a Bible school for 10 days. Cold, rainy, spitting snow off and on almost every day. Little heater over in the side of that big place that was there to heat up that entire room. About 70 or so students and a little, what we would call in your mind's eye, like a pot-bellied stove, although it's square. And they put a little bit of coal in there to try to heat up the tiles so that it would warm the room. It's so cold in that room that you would wear a shirt and tie and a coat, but then you'd put on an overcoat and you'd button up that overcoat. And when you got done preaching, you would take your handkerchief or something and put it on your throat because it was cold. Even though you were inside and even though there was a heater, you were, it was cold in there and your vocal cords would get real cold. A lot of times while you were teaching, smoke's coming out inside a building. And we taught for 10 days and it was just about time for us to leave. And in the evening times when we didn't have a meeting, we would, we would pack up and it looked very much like it did and does out there today. It's just gray, and cold, and the world is just going by, not even realizing what's going on in that room for 10 days. Old and young alike sitting in there. Some people in there with their scarves and their overcoats on and a, a blanket wrapped around them in their 70s and 80s that are sitting there taking notes. Way past what you would ever think that would even be coming to a Bible school. Sit right on the front row. We about got done. I, at one time, I got a little carried away. Jim got up to sing a song. And the song was, I got so much to thank Him for. Yeah. I got so much to praise Him for. You see, He has been so good to me. And I couldn't stand it. I'm on the other side of the world from my wife and from my church. I'm over there and it's just me and Jim and a bunch of people that I probably will never see again. And the thing just sort of overwhelmed me and I thought, you know, if I go from right here, I'm good to go. And I thought, man, God has been so good to allow me to be here right now. And I hollered out. I mean, I hollered out. Amen. And they jumped out of their skin. All the women on this side and all the men on this side, they didn't even sit together in class. And they all turned around and looked at me like they were ready to impale me or lynch me or something. They were like, and they didn't understand. And he kept singing and I said, that's right. And they're like, you're the devil. We don't do that. Don't, uh-uh. So Jim called Milcha, our interpreter, and he took out a piece of paper and he drew a teapot. You've heard me tell the story. And Jim said, what Brother Peacock is trying to say is the same thing that a teapot says when the fire gets under it. Yeah. The water begins to boil. Yeah. The steam comes up. Amen. And he said, and it whistles in there. And Milcha said, we don't have a word. He goes, it goes, boop. <laughs> and they, you see him light up. Because we would put that coffee pot back on that pot-bellied stove I say coffee pot, you heated water and then you put this powdered stuff in a cup and they called that coffee. And you would have that hot water and then put it back on and then it would whistle. A couple of days later he got to singing. And the Lord moved in that old dark, dank place and the providence of Transylvania that had seen so much bloodshed and God just began to sort of work His way in there almost like a cloud or a mist came in there. And it was just, it was just sweet. Yeah. And I'm trying to like not... I mean, my pot's boiling, but I'm thinking I got, I got, to, I got to be sensitive. This is, you know, because they sing everything in a minor key. They get excited about nothing. Tires can roll off the back of the van at 100 miles an hour, and they're like, huh, it is Romania. <laughs> the flashlight doesn't work. Huh, it is Romania. It's like, nothing works in Romania. And all of a sudden, in the corner, boop. <laughs> and then on the side, boop. And then, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> They didn't know to say amen. amen. 
Well, we were getting ready to go. We got finished that last day. We were leaving at dark 30 the next morning, riding in a micro mini bus with 10 gallons of diesel fuel in it because the military had taken everything else. And there was a missionary over there that had 10 gallons of diesel fuel and he let us have it to put in the van that we were in. So we went by for the morning meeting there before we got ready to leave. We finished with the class and Milch just said in English to us, please sit down. So Jim and I sat down. And then the whole class came up front. On the back side of the green board we had been using all week, unbeknownst to us, after we had left every afternoon, they had learned in English all the words of I have so much to thank Him for. And in our native tongue, not theirs, after only about a week's worth of practice and somewhat broken at times, as He pointed to the words, they sang every word as our offering. We have so much to thank Him for. For sending you all over here to tell us about Him. Amen. Gratitude will sustain you when money Amen. won't. Amen. Gratitude will stay with you when friends desert you. Gratitude will keep you from depression yes. and discouragement. Amen. When you learn to recognize that it's that gratitude, you're saying to the Lord, I sure am glad you're here with me. Yes. I sure am glad you didn't desert me in this fiery furnace. Amen. Well, shall I close with this? Don't forget, we still have the apostles rowing and toiling against the wind and the waves. And the Lord's watching the whole thing. you got to give it to them. They didn't quit rowing. And the Bible said that the Lord was walking on the water and He would have passed by. But somebody in that boat said, Lord, Help me. And the Lord said, Would you all like me to be in that boat with you right now? You don't want me to just calm the storm, do you? You know Pete walks on the water. You know the whole story. But you ever read the last of the story? The Lord and Pete got back in the boat. But the wind's no longer contrary. And the waves are no longer about to sink their ship. The Lord turned on the bilge pump. So I'm preacher, I don't know about it. Listen, if he can take the water from Noah's flood off the earth, yes. he can take a few gallons of water out of the bottom of a boat. Amen. And when they hit the ground on the other side, don't tell me them boys didn't say, man, wasn't that the coolest thing? We were about to drown. We were going under. That's the worst storm. It was a Euryclidon. It was terrible. Until Jesus got on board. And then the story began to be about Jesus in the storm instead of just the storm. It's, He didn't desert you. He didn't leave you. He's just there with you. The Bible says at the end of that passage that many heard the story. What story? If I know fishermen, we tend to make 12 inches look like 20. Take that picture just a certain way, you know, and...
I bet you that they said, man, this storm was horrible. Till Jesus showed up. But I'm going to bet you they said this. We sure are glad for that storm. Because if it hadn't been for that storm, we wouldn't have seen Jesus walking on the water. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Where are the nine that return to give God glory? Would you pause for a minute? Many already have out of their seats. But instead of coming to the altar today to confess your sins and get right with God, would you consider this morning for just a few minutes, I'm not going to prolong it, Would you consider coming to the altar today and giving glory to God by thanking Him for whatever trouble you have in your life? Would you consider an altar call to thank Him for what He's allowed to happen in your life and never leaving you and never forsaking you, even though you may not to this day still understand it? Could you testify today that, Lord, thank You for the trouble. Thank you for the trial. Thank you for the tribulation. I'm, I'm learning some things about you that I wouldn't otherwise know. Folks are coming. Don't, don't, don't wait. Just come on if you would. God's been help to you during time of trouble. Can you thank Him for trusting you with trouble? It's how you give Him glory. Some are still coming. We're waiting. We're not going to rush. You're giving to God one thing that He cannot give Himself. You're giving Him thanks. And by doing that, it is the epitome of trust. Not saying, Lord, I understand it. You're saying, Lord, I'm grateful for it because I know You do all things well. I know you know what you're doing. Lord, I I trust you. And in heaven right now, it's more than just the angels that are saying glory to God. It's the people at 3857 and those that are tuned in. And the Lord said, shh, y'all be quiet just a minute. There's some people that ain't here yet. I sure do like it when the one comes. I'm not worried about the nine. I sure appreciate the one. If that's you, we'll wait. We're not going to rush. I'm not going to play an invitation. I just want you to, in the quietness of the hour, just to think how good it is that God's allowed you to go through things and you're still here. And He has never <coughs> forsaken you. A young lady asked me one time who had messed up pretty gravely and she said, Preacher, how do I thank the Lord for that? I said, thank the Lord that when you mess up, you confess up. You can thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses from all sin. And you can get back up and you can go on and whether the brethren forget or not, God's forgotten it, put it as far as the east is from the west. You know what she said? "I, I get it, I get it, I get it. She said, I'll be back in a little bit. And down she went. She made a mess. But thank God she had somewhere to run. Thank God she had a person to be able to come to. We're going to wait for a few moments.
Our Father, we sure do appreciate you putting these kinds of stories in the Bible to show us the, the deep, deep truths in the Bible. The things that make us know that you understand us though we are feeble and frail as dust. To see that even in our frailties and in our weaknesses you're still strong. We don't expect after this service is over with today to necessarily understand any better. But we do hope that we rise from this meeting and say I'm going to learn to be thankful in all things so that I can bring in my life and through my trouble and trials I can bring glory to you. Lord, thank you for this church and these people. Thank you for the great manifestation of the things that you've done here through your people. I pray, God, that you'll continue to bless them in their personal lives, their individual lives, their family lives, their business lives, and us together as a church family. I pray, God, that you'll watch over them and care for them. Take care of them as only you can. Help us to move far and beyond trying to understand. Help us to learn to accept and to be thankful. We pray that you'll bless this day. We thank you so much for the rain that has now washed the yellow pollen out of the air. So thankful that the rain causes things to grow. And Lord, we'd ask that when rain comes in our life, we'll recognize it as something that assists us in washing things out and making things grow. Please bless this day, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.